Okay, well, ladies and gents, look, welcome to episode two of our to- uh, Trenches to the Tour. And as the, as the title says, it's been kind of coming from the grassroots level and then finding success at tour, both coaching and um, playing in many cases. And I'm very pleased to welcome this evening our master professional, 83 years young, and I say young, as we all know during the course of the evening, that his desire and, and motivation for the game is is still very, very evident, talking to him, and I could just chat to him um, for, for hours, which hopefully we will do this evening. And I just want to chronicle a little bit about um, Howard's journey, first of all, very briefly, because this will hopefully come out during the the, the, the evening, but in, I think, 1949, his parents took on the role of student stewardess at Reddish Vale um, Golf Club, which was an Alistair McKenzie design golf course. And I know later on in the evening, Henry Cotton, I always recall him saying the 16th hole was one of the best holes he'd ever seen. And obviously, Howard ultimately ended up having a relationship with Henry Cotton at Panina and Tony playing with Sylvia and spending time with the... Um, the great man, so that's going to come up hopefully this evening. And then from there, um, Howard's parents got the job at Hillside as student stewardess in 51, 1951. So obviously he was, as a Southport lad anyway, he was returning back and and learning a bit of skill playing at um, Hillside. And then a little bit of national service before then becoming um, uh, assistant professional at um, Formby uh, Golf Club, which obviously another fantastic Lynx golf course. And after that period, if I get the kind of chronologically right, he got the job at Dewsbury, as we just briefly discussed before we came online, over in Yorkshire, where he was both greenkeeper and professional, kind of balancing those two roles and then beginning to start a family, where he then... From that period, in 1962, got the job at um, Shaw Hill in Chorley, um, private golf club there. Um, Became a very, very successful coach, retailer, um, tutor for the PGA and various other things. And then from there, pressing on to Duxbury Park, the municipal, he was obviously being recognised for what he did at Chorley, uh, at, at Shaw Hill so well. And got the job at the municipal of Duxbury Park in 77 when that opened, which like all the munis at that time was an incredibly busy venue. And, and I know certainly from a retail point of view, that was a fantastic venue and a lot of footfall and so on. And there on, on to Penina in 87 with the, the great Sir Henry Cotton, and, uh, which was obviously a, a fantastic job. And then back to secure the, in 88 or 89, starting the job as Golf Union of Ireland um, national coach for 15 years to 2004. And obviously in that time period, as, as the evening ensues, he was exposed to teaching Harrington and Darren Clark and Graham McDowell and um, many, Garth McGimsey and some of the, the great um, amateur players as well, and young Rory. And obviously has been awarded master professional status. And I must say that's alongside with his son. So I think it's the only father and son combo that have them are both master professionals, which is a fantastic accolade and says a lot about both these gentlemen. And um, then progressing from here, Howard's obviously still passionate and now involved, and Tony's involved um, with the European Disabled Golf Association, which again, we're going to touch on this evening. So, welcome, Howard. Thank you very much. Carry on. Thank you very much, Adrian, and uh, for inviting me to have a chat in Zoom. And uh, good evening, everyone. Here it is. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, I saw the first one that you did last last week, and it was I've really enjoyed it with um, David and um, and Simon. Uh, yeah. you know, sharing their experiences and ideas and also the observations of how things have moved on in playing and teaching or coaching, if you want to call it that, in the game. And there were so many good points raised. And, uh, you know, you were talking about field players and the mental game, how important that is and the drills and give pupils a programme, you know, etc. to work on. I really enjoyed that con- contribution they made. I thought it was very good. 
and I think the last two was uh, you never stop learning, which is what what they were saying as well, which is has been forever. And there's always, you know, you always ask somebody if you want to know something. I think that was a good thing that they they certainly found a great help to one another. They're obviously great friends. And, yeah, no, uh, they're all games, good. even though it's a little bit opposites, but that's good. No, so thank, thank you, you for, for inviting me anyway. No, it's great. I know everybody enjoys it. So just looking on this evening, I've got Howard's book here, which has kind of prompted me and, and myself and Howard go back a wee while because I was the pro at Chorley Golf Club Hall of Hill, where we've got Laura Fairclough, ex Solheim Cup player with us this evening. And obviously Howard coached Laura and he was in my direct competition. He just did it a little bit better than me um, over, <laughs> over the road and, 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 and did very well. But before that, Howard, I mean, the book here, which I'm, we're going to allude to throughout the evening, is a fantastic book. It's How His Stories, Observations and Suggestions by Howard Bennett. And it's really chronicling his, his kind of 50 years in coaching and so on. And there's, it's a kind of little Harvey Pennick red book, if I can I made lots of great information in this book for both coach and player. Uh, some fantastic stuff. But just going back to your history, um, Howard, when, you know, when your parents got the job, obviously there's Reddish Vale, where you're with Tom Fairburn, who was a very good professional, but then at Hillside, I know John Burton was the pro and his brother was Dick Burton, so on, Ryder Cup players. That was presumably when the passion for playing, I take it, uh, developed initially and then going on to Formby, where you couldn't have hoped for two more fantastic golf clubs, mm. albeit, I know in those days with Formby and all golf clubs, obviously the pros were to a degree, I mean, it's not the case now, obviously they're very welcoming, but now to the degree we were second class citizens and the likes of Henry Cotton and so on. I hope you can take us back to those days of kind of hillside and Formby and earning two shillings a week or whatever you were earning and, 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 and so on and learning your craft. Yeah. Well, basically, Reddish Fail and Tom Fairburn was the pro there, as some of you may recall, and his brother George was the pro as well. But um, I was 12 years of age, and uh, he asked me to help him in the shop, cleaning the, cleaning the floor and getting the shellac ready for doing the clubs and everything else. And in return, he said, you can come and caddy for me, which was very good of him. <laughs> So well, I learned a lot from him. He never actually practiced uh, t hitting golf balls, and like, he just practiced on the golf course, which is what it, that was his way of practicing. Yes, that was an eye opener. And then he occasionally gave me some tips, which was great. Um, and um, then we proceeded to go to the hillside, like you said. And uh, from being uh, anybody who played British Fail Golf Club, I'm sure you know it's a pretty good mm -hmm. golf course. The last three mm -hmm. holes in particular were very good. Mm. Um, the last hole was about a heartbreak hill. A lot of people had heart, heart attacks on that one. I, I remember it. Um, but then I went to Hillside, of course, and that was the old hillside where they had four holes. I think it was in the top and they got rid of those and made it as it is now. And um, But I learned to play Lynx golf there. I learned yeah. a lot at Reddish Fields, you know, with the ups and downs. And then you learned more on the Lynx courses. Um, but I didn't really see much of John Burton. He was, I used to watch him play a lot, obviously, and uh, mm. he was a great uh, iron player and hit drivers off the deck just straight as an arrow. They never faded at all off the deck. And of course, Lynx courses, you know, they were so tight lies. And I, it's amazing how he, he hit the ball straight with his driver off the deck. Incredible. You learn some things from all of these things, yeah. Um, and, and then I did my two years national service. <laughs> Yeah, and then obviously, you, I know Henry Cotton played at Formby as well, didn't he, in those days, and the days where he yeah, did when I was parked his Rolls-Royce in the yeah, car park. There, absolutely, and I remember that uh, I wasn't quite sold, but it goes when he came to play the, uh, an exhibition or something there, the pros, we were never allowed in the clubhouse, none of us. Uh, even the pros had to be invited, TJD Milton at that time. And uh, he said, well, if the pros are not uh, coming in, because they could change in the clubhouse. He said, no, if the pros are not allowed, I'll change in, in the car park. And that's what he did. Went and played, then he got back in the car and went away. So, uh, so he was a great supporter of uh, pro golf, obviously. Yeah, fantastic. And then yeah. we, we fast forward. Obviously, you were at uh, uh, Dewsbury. You, you secured the job there and you were kind of balancing that between doing a bit of greenkeeping and, and actually... Yeah. Um, uh, obviously coaching yeah, and being a professional in the afternoon if you like. Yeah that's right, I worked on the course in the morning just before I went go from Formby if I may um, 
it was so important. I mean, and I know this is probably what happened a lot in the past that assistants were really shopkeepers. Mm. And, and I'm not, it's not criticizing who I was working for. We did, he showed me how to do repairs and one, one thing and another. But basically, um, whenever he wasn't teaching, he wasn't in the shop very much and he relied obviously on, on myself. I was the only one there. Mm. But when it got quiet, I, they had a putting green out there, which is still there, and that's where I hold my putting skills. Right, that <laughs> which was, was I, I didn't realise that that was uh, my my short game was the strength of my game when I used to play. Because, uh, but, but that's where it started. The other thing was that when I was there and he was on holiday, my my pro there, TJ, and uh, the phone rang and it said, uh, "This is." Uh, Lord Derby's secretary here, he wants to book a lesson with the professional. And I said, well, I'm sorry, he's not here, sir. And uh, he said, well, who is there? And I said, well, it's only me, sir. He said, I knew you anyway. I said, well, I'm the assistant. He said, well, you'll do. <laughs> so I was quite nervous, obviously. And uh, I sort of, uh, anyway, he came and he, he was fantastic, Lord Derby. And he said, oh, well, nice to meet you. We, we went on and we played nine holes. And, and then he went away, thank you very much. Anyway, when the boss came back about a week or two later, uh, the phone rang again and he said, uh, who's that on the phone? I said, it's Lord Derby's secretary, sir. <laughs> he said, what does he want? He said, he wants me to play golf with him. <laughs> he said, doesn't he want me, the pro? He said, he always plays with me. I said, I'm awfully sorry, I can't do anything. He's asked me to play, so I've got to play. So he was a bit upset. Anyway, that was a little story, but... Brilliant. Any so back to... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the greenkeeper, pro greenkeeper. Um, yeah, it was, um, it was a great experience. I mean, I, I was just the guy doing what the head greenkeeper told me to do in the mornings. That was the, the deal, as it were, the agreement. And mainly, especially in the summer, apart from all the winter work we did, it was really cutting the greens. I was, I was having a bit of a lack of earlier on, you know, with uh, see, and I said, yeah. you know, they had the overgreens. I don't know anybody knows about overgreens. I'm giving my age away, obviously, now, but they, they were, had long handles and you had three boxes in the front and you had to take them from, from one green to the next to the next. And of course, it is a very hilly golf course. And by the time you finished it, your arms are hanging off. And the, the head geek was said to me, said, now look, uh, Howard, he said, you've got to get these greens cut in the, in the summer. He said, you've got to get them cut three times a week. I said, I want them finished by a certain time because people are going out, especially on competition days. So I worked it out that if I did what he said, I wouldn't be able to finish around about two o'clock in the afternoon. I thought, well, that's, I can't do any teaching in the afternoon then. So I went, he used to go out very early in the morning when it was daybreak. And of course, in those days, he was very insistent that you switch the greens to get the dew off before you before you actually uh, cut the greens. So I used to get up as early as I could. As soon as it was daylight, I was there. Half past four or five o'clock in the morning, switching the greens and cutting them. And I used to finish about 11 o'clock in the morning. And he'd come up to me and say, what are you doing? You, you must be cutting them too fast, he said, but they look okay. I said, well, if I start when you want me to, I'll never finish till two o'clock. I said, so I get up early in the morning and do it. So he was quite happy, but <laughs> he didn't like Brilliant. it. But it, but it, but it, but uh, it did the job. Means to an end, and he yeah, yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> and that a pretty good negotiator in those days. Well, I think you've always have been. I think that's evident. So talking about negotiation and negotiating your way out of a job that you'd already accepted, um, we're going to fast forward now, and you'll probably know what I mean by that. You um, applied for uh, from. Jews being district and so on, you applied for a couple of jobs simultaneously. One came up at Shore Hill in Chorley, which I think you really fancied, Absolutely. and another one at um, Leek. And as is you won't, you went along and we were chatting and it, it reminded me actually of the days when you applied for a professional's job that you played with the committee or the members or mm -hmm. somebody and they kind of got the cut of your jib and saw whether you're a decent fellow or not and whether you could play and so on. So perhaps you could briefly talk to us about getting your job at yeah. one venue and then <laughs> deciding to jump well, ship. Interesting, but I think this is a, this is a good advert for being honest with people, quite mm -hmm. honestly. Um, I wanted the short hill job. Uh, I, was coming, I was obviously being in tune and I thought I'd be doing this pro greenkeeping, you know, and I really wasn't playing that much golf anyway. I thought, I didn't realise it was a playing lesson as well. So I thought, I thought crimes. I hope I play reasonably well, you know, just to not make a fool of myself. But anyway, 
short story, I actually played very, very well. I went around in power, which for me on that day was good. And everybody said, hey, you can still play this game, you can't you? I said, well, I, uh, thank you very much for your compliments. And I said, um, and they said, okay, and we had an interview. It seemed to go very well, I thought, that's good. And they said, well, we'll let you know, we're still interviewing the shortlist, he said, and we'll let you know within the next week or so. So I went home, and then the other one that I'm applying for was Leak Golf Club. And no sooner I got home, there was a letter on the desk saying, we'd like to interview you, come and see us next week. So I went to this and I did the interview and they said, they offered me the job there and then I said, well, can you give me 24 hours? I said, because to be honest with you, I've I already had an interview and uh, can you give me time to think about it? I'd like to discuss it with my wife and everything. I'll ring you tomorrow. So I did and I got home and I thought, I'll ring Shaw Hill in the morning just to see if they've appointed somebody because it's gone on now for about two or three weeks. So I rang her and I said, I hope you don't mind me ringing. I said, um, uh, I just bring to see if you made an appointment at Shore Hill. And he said, well, I said, well, the only reason I'm asking, I said, I'm not being rude. I said, because I'm, I had that job offered in another golf club. And I said, I, really, I would like Shore Hill Golf Club. I said, but um, I didn't tell him the name of the golf club. And he said, oh, well, we haven't finished interviewing yet. So I thought that was a nice way of saying you haven't got the job. <laughs> so I accepted the job at League. And no sooner I accepted the job and started at League, that week I got a letter from... Uh, Shaw Hill saying I was appointed there. So I thought, what the heck am I going to do here? So I went up to the committee and I said, look, I've got to be honest with you. I said, this is what's happened. And they said, you know, Mr. Bennett, I'm glad you really come and said to it. He said, because the guy that was going to be next off of the job, if you turned it down, was a fellow called, I think it was Peter Stebbings, or Stebbings, his name it was. Yeah, yeah. And he said he really wanted a job because he lives local. Anyway, the history is that he stayed there over 30 years, I think, when he, when he took over. Well, I, I did my month's notice or whatever it was, and he went back to Shore Hill. So that was a, a rather big adventure. But I, I think I'm glad I've told everybody, honestly, what, what I was thinking, you know. And I think that, that honesty, as we spoke about, obviously <laughs> comes through in your coaching. So now, just briefly, because I do want to get on to all the coaching, you've done so much in your, your career, but you got to um, Shore Hill there and built a very, very thriving retail business where I know that people traveled from the Lake District and all over and you had a great reputation for you know selling golf clubs and so on but also not to forget at that time you could also still play the game because you qualified for the Open Championship at, um, when Tony Jacklin won in uh, 69 at yeah. Lytham yeah. so obviously you were no slouch and you were managing to balance retailing with coaching, with playing, probably a half decent game still. So for me, that, uh, which will come across this evening, I hope, that you're just the consummate pro, that everything you try and do, you're doing to the best of your ability and uh, properly. And, and that business you had there, I think some of the retail success when we chatted, I know your parents had a, a news agent and a paper shop, and I think you, whether subliminally or otherwise, picked up some skills of how to, treat people or deal with people which is what our business is we're in the yeah. we're in the, the people business I always remember Butch Harmon saying about your brother he's in the people business but doesn't like people That's right. which always amused me and I think we've got a few like that sometimes but um, you you had a great business there and you were kind of probably one of the first retailers to have a mailing list but nowadays it's commonplace but we've, we've all got email we've all got uh, right. mailing lists at the club and so on but you were as is with many things, a pioneer. So you could tell me a little bit about the job and how kind of well it went. And I think ultimately to the degree where you built your own shop and or, or built your own premises. Yeah, it's, um, it's part of history that um, uh, basically we had a, a I don't know anybody, not many people know about Shaw Hill Golf Club in regards to what the shop used to be there. The Chevalier used to be there, a very good player and mm. nice guy. And Chevalier, Cam, you all probably know about the Chevaliers and the Holy Ones. Holy Ones, yeah. And basically, uh, it was a everybody went through a passageway to the locker rooms, men and women. And and it, my shop was underneath the stairs, and it was probably not much bigger than this 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 little room here, a little bit longer maybe. And uh, unless I had this, I had a display window which they all went past. They didn't see into the shop, but they saw the display window, which was a big advantage. 
And the funny thing was, when I first went there, uh, I was setting this window out, and this guy behind me says, you are new pro, lad. I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, never make any money here, lad. And I thought, I'm blue, I'll show you. <laughs> He that was me. the first reaction I got. I thought, <laughs> that was his first big mistake. That's a great. That said, no, the other guys had never had any money. Else. And, and, so that was a big challenge. Anyway, a long story short, we actually, were, I was going to a pro-am, ping pro-am in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, you know, a little bit later after a couple of years being in this dungeon, as it were. And, but we did reasonably well. Hmm. Um, sorry about I'll just to, That's okay, don't worry. Talk about later, if I may, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, that'll be the, that'll be the press, the the press the after, it'll be the press after you they will have heard oh no, yeah and um i went over there in answer fact with my wife and we played a, there was another couple that went with us and we played in the prime there and i looked at what was going on in america and i thought these people and usually what happens in america not all of it seems to happen in in this uk and i thought these guys sports shops stuck it high you know golf shots and i think the pros were having a rough time was asking them oh they're killing us i thought crimes will get back and i thought i had to do something when i got back and that's where it started really and mm. um i said to the committee i said i've got a problem here i said this shop's not doing any good and when i first came in somebody told me i wasn't going to be able to stay here long because i wouldn't make any money I said, but what I would like is to have a shop over there on the spare ground, right opposite the clubhouse. And he said, oh, that's not possible, Mr. Mm. Lennon. We haven't got the money. I said, well, if I put a, a proposal to you, would you listen to it? He said, yeah, go ahead. So I said, well, I'll build the shop there. I said, um, but I must have an agreement for 10 years that you won't sack me. And I said, if you do sack me, then you pay whatever it is, pro rata. If it, let's just say a figure was ten thousand pound or whatever the figure was. So if you sack me after the first year, you give me nine thousand, and if you get to the five years, you pay me five thousand, and then at the end of ten years, it's all yours. <laughs> and the mouths open. And they sort of say, "Well, that sounds a good deal. Let's just talk about it when you leave the room." So anyway, that's a, that's the history of it. Right. Basically, uh, I think it was probably one of the. I'm not, you know, it's terrible when I talk like this because you're trying to roll, roll your own home. But it was one of the first things that was going to happen as well. And it yeah. did happen. Uh, well, I think in those days, I'm just going to your, I think, obviously, you became a very successful retailer. And I think there were two or three traits that um, that, that became apparent that you were studying retailing and kind of probably human behavior a little bit ahead of other people. And I think you had that kind of concept that treat people as you would like to be treated mm. and, and care about people, which I'll come back to in the book when it comes to coaching. Mm. And then also the, um, the Zig Ziglar quote, which amused me when we, <laughs> we, we spoke, which um, you might want to allude to. Well, yeah, yeah, well, well, but one, one, I was quite an avid reader of obviously golf books, but one of the little books that I got, uh, suggested to the PGA many years ago when I was one of the swing instructors and business instructors, I said, you should get this little book here, Skills with People. And it's been written a long, long time ago, and it's such an easy read. If I can read it, anybody can read it. It's uh, such an, e an easy read. And it started in 68 and 85, but it was a great book. It helped me, apart from working in the shop with my, uh, helping in the paper shop, um, that helps it. The skills with people are so important. As you say, I, when everybody comes through that front door or through your shop door or wherever it is, you want to be treated like, you want to treat, be treated, you know, treat them like you want to be treated. That's what I've always believed. And that's the way my family, I copied that from my mother and father. And everybody came in, you know, welcome and happy and what, you know. And I think that is it. And I think the other thing that Zig Ziglar, who was a motivational speaker and a very mm. successful person in life and business, and uh, but motivational. And the other thing that stuck in my mind when you were listening to all these uh, tapes that I used to have and um, or conferences I used to go to, and this Zig Ziglar said, when that person comes in through that door, treat him like you would like to be treated, or her, or whoever it was. He said, and the other thing to remember, which is very important, that that person has got your money in their pocket. <laughs> and he said, I said, that sounds a bit cruel. He said, but it's true. He said, so make them comfortable, make them happy. Don't just say, can I help you? Just say, it's an awful day out there. It's a lovely day. Have you got your sun cream? Or whatever it is, just don't ask him, can I help you? Because it's either yes or no. So there's little things like that that 
came in and stuck in my mind, but that one I thought was really good where you said, don't forget when that person comes through that door, they've got your money in their pocket. So you better mm -hmm. treat them properly. So, which sounds a yeah. bit really tough, but it's not, it's, it's true. Treat no, them, it, treat it, 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 it's just I think the other thing is this, that I, I, I'm, I bring this up because you and I bring it up, but I, people thought that I was a, 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 a discount guy. In the, and I didn't. All I did, I bought discontinued lines, which every pro could buy. But you had to buy them in certain bit of bulk quantity, six sets of this or whatever it is, so many shoes. And, and then you got the, they usually were discontinued lines, which were eventually happened nearly every other year or every year. And I just passed on that. Uh, I still made 50% profit. And I think you mentioned that even your, <laughs> even your parents were brilliant, which is your parents had doing that with sugar cubes in the shop and you'd exactly. kind of seen that as a loss, yeah. a loss, loss leader. leader. It's the loss leaders. And then you get people in, then they'll see something else. It's impulse buying. If you've set your shop out right, it's, in some, it's, it's nothing changed. It's got better probably, I don't know. I think um, you were just a, a good, you, you know, you you became a, a very good retailer. And there were many, many of them I could name in the oh. UK at that time. I know um, I always had a lot of pros at that time, but I, it wasn't because I was trying to take their channel silly. But uh, and then PGA said it was against the rules, and you know we had a bit of a contention. But anyway, that's history. But mm. uh, they did try to do this. They tried to throw me out of PGA, but I, I, I actually took them to court with the barrister in London and won my case. But uh, it's not being big. I just thought it was very good for the profession, not just me. No, uh, I, yeah, we had that freedom to do what we can within reason. Yeah, and I think the retail laws then and so on, it's yeah. evolution. It's like the internet yeah. now saying, well, it can't go away or if Tesco's yeah. can't open next to Asda or what have you, you had foresight and you were ahead of the curve in yeah. terms of retailing and mailing lists and most of the pros, well, you can't steal my members or you can't, you, had no. that, you didn't have that free enterprise and the pro, you know, PGA were trying to protect it and tried to find you, as you say. And it's, when we look back now, the, the younger pros in the audience will find yeah. that incredible or hard to believe and there were a couple of local pros i know yeah. who were you know um, but it but you set the tone really so but that again to me it shows the kind of that entrepreneurial pioneering um, nature so going from there howard as i said i mentioned you're obviously a competent player teeing it up in the open in 69 but Around that period, you, you were fortunate enough to spend time with John Jacobs at his Blackpool. John Jacobs had a series of golf driving ranges around the country. And yeah. obviously he had one at Blackpool and yourself and Peter McGuinness and your pals would go up and observe him yeah. coach. And how, how valuable was that? In your oh, life? tremendous. I mean, uh, it, it was tremendous. And he was such a great guy and he was very kind. He never charged any of the pros that you probably all, all know. They never charged yeah. for anything. Charged the the the, the, the control of him on it, but he, that was okay. And he did that because he thought he'd get less lessons, and he actually got more lessons when he charged a lot. But um, no, he's a, he was a great man, and he was uh, Peter McGuinness and I. Peter McGuinness was a very good player, as you know, probably. Yeah. And um, he, we used to watch him teach everybody, Anne Irvin and people like that who played for England and all the rest of that, and a lot of good players. And McGuinness, there was all a mixture of everything. So you learned. An awful lot from him but his as you know his, his, his <coughs> mantra was diagnose explanation correction you can't get away from that to start with but you go and see a consultant it's the same they give you half an hour although John was very much half an hour he could tell you everything in half an hour he, he died over so quickly and gave the explanation of why and then they give you the correction and then that was it so it was fantastic it was a great learning experience and then afterwards at the end of the night and it was freezing cold this was in the winter mostly and he would be, he'd be drinking a little bit of something to keep him warm. <laughs> but yeah. He was okay. He was always, you know, he was always uh, on track. He was never, you know. Um, and then at the end of it, he said, okay, okay, come on, Peter and Howard, let's have a look at you, see what, you know, anything you want to ask. And, and that was at the end of about a three-hour lesson in cold weather and uh, different people. He was fantastic. And uh, a lot of it was, it is, you can't argue with what he said even today. And I think it should still be in the PGI. I mean, he offered when I became you know, later on, I invited him to come up and talk, as you may allude to a little bit later, but uh, he would never take any money. I said, John, will you please come up and give a talk to the North Region, you know, when I was chairman? And he said, yeah. I said, well, what do I, what, you know, give us your chance. I said, I don't want anything. I'll just stay with some friends up there. He said, it's fantastic. I'd love to do it. Well, no. you know, the, the pictures in the book, as you know. And, uh, yeah, I just can see that. Yeah, I don't know any, any of the... <laughs> 
any of the folks there. I could just hold it up to the screen. That was yeah, 19, 19, 1985. And I, I, put, I, can, I can see a picture of myself in there with a rather large haircut. And, um, that it wasn't like was, Tommy Fleetwood, was it? Well, it's, it's similar, actually. I, I think I had it permed at that time. Right. Which, um, <laughs> was against well, he was fantastic. I, I yeah. couldn't, you know, and, and he said to me, he said, how would you say, you know, because at that time I was a PGA instructor, the bit of a negotiation went there. I don't know what I told you about oh, that. I don't really? know if I have time to tell you. But they wanted me to be a business instructor. And I said, I don't want to be a business instructor. I don't want to be a, a, a swing instructor. We haven't got a place for a swing instructor. I said, well, I don't want to be a business then. I said, well, I will do a deal with you. <laughs> I got used to deals, I think. As is I your said, well, I'll an agreement, not a deal, an agreement. And what's that, Howard? I said, well, when there's a vacancy comes as a swing instructor, will I have the first choice? To be an observer, I, I, I had to qualify to get, to get it. And that's another story as well. But, um, and they said, uh, what do you mean? I said, well, when does a swing instructor comes available? I'll do, the, I'll do the business for a year or two. I'm not going to wait too much longer. I said, but I want to be a swing instructor. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm accepted and pass the exam. So that was the deal. And then eventually I did that. So I said, I won't, do swing, I won't be doing business and together. So I just want to do that. You know. So that was good. Superb. And then obviously you, uh, at that time when you were at um, Shaw Hill and, and Dutchby, you used to holiday at Panina yeah. and, and yourself and... Um, your late wife Sylvia and Tony, of course, and whatever you went over and had a relationship or managed to eventually get to, well, you could tell me about your meeting or your first chance yeah. to actually yeah. watch Sir Henry Cotton coach. Yeah, I went there basically because they used to have the Algarve Open, as it was called there, and we used to play in the tournament there and used to go there <clears> and, and, um, and they had prom before it. And it so that's when I first went. And we had the attic rooms, which at that time was the cheapest in the hotel, the dearest now because they made them into uh, penthouses. And, uh, and then eventually uh, our son Anthony came with us later on and uh, we all got to know Henry, he was fantastic to us and uh, I said to my wife, I said, I really would love to watch Henry coach. I said, I've got to bring up the courage and the, and the, and the cheek to go and ask him. So I then, this particular day he was walking up and he was on his own. I said, right after I said, Mr. Cotton, I'm Howard Bennett from England, a pro. He said, oh, nice to see you. Uh, Howard Bennett, uh, I said, is it possible for me to watch you just go do some coaching on the French ground? He said, well, I'm there every morning from whatever time it was, 9.30, and we're right there till about one o'clock. He said, I'm teaching all sorts of different people. At that time, people like uh, uh, Howard Clark was going, and James and Brown and, and Roddy Carr and Joe Carr and all those were there, and apart from just the paying customer, of course, as yeah. well, which is the Americans and whatever. So I learned an awful lot there, yeah, of his way of coaching and what his priorities were, which is, uh, but he only gave you one little key. It's like a jigsaw. He gave you a piece of the jigsaw and then you had to work it out from there and then take you from there. So it was a good learning experience. I learned a lot from him and the way hitting the tire, of course, he got a lot of stick about that. And he was always recognized as a hands player. But if you ever saw his, his actually rotation of his body, yeah, he had wonderful hands, big ones, mm. but he had a wonderful feel. Yeah. But he, his idea was from playing all the great amp, uh, pros at that time in his generation, uh, they were hitting it further and he had to, he had to make sure that he could try and get this distance. And he, he found out about the tyre, as many of you may know, he came out of the club at one of his golf clubs at, uh, in London and there was a spare tyre on the ground and he kicked it to kick it out of the way and he, he automatically said, that's it. Because he used to swing in the rough to build his hands and arms up. You know, mm. thick, thick rough. He said, I don't need to go to the rough now. I know I can do certain exercises on it. And he was yeah. very adamant that when you practice this way, you always had the contra exercise, so you build both arms. He was very much a fitness person, although he had very round shoulders, so he, he, he regretted he didn't do. Uh, well, I believe, and I'm just, just looking here now, I've got his little book here, the game, yeah. this game of golf, Henry Cotton, which I used to love reading as an assistant mm. pro because it's yeah. just got so many fantastic right. pictures and even this one today I've got it out maximum speed at impact and he's got yeah. all the pictures of Hogan and Sneed and Percy obviously Ryder Cup players and everything and obviously an open champion and went on to with you know yeah. Dunlop 75 names well, there's a little him. story about him winning the first uh, open I don't know if you've heard this one but it's uh, he was playing so badly when it went there mm. 
He said, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna qualify on this. And he was so distraught, he was thinking, I'm not playing. This is true, this because and he said, um, and he said, um, I was so bad, he said, the day before the first round, he said, I wrote a, th a, li a little prayer. And he went, he wasn't a Catholic at that time. I don't want to get involved in religion, please. Yep. But he, he, and the only church that was there was a Catholic church. He wrote this thing out, so I don't know what he put in it. I don't know what he put in it, but he said, I put it in there. He said, he must have said, please help me or something. And, and uh, he said, the rest is history. I won the thing. I didn't even want to play. And he was very nervous. Was when he had the ball the, named the, after him, was it uh, uh, Dunlop 65? 65, yeah, when he shot and, uh, Yeah, and he said, I didn't exactly want to play right. in this. And he, and he was, a, I think, you know, reading back, he was an insipid child that built himself up and so oh, yeah. he was, was like, the yeah, one yeah. of the first players that no. was doing contra exercises. He, had to work he spoke hard. about him, you know, obviously you said all the players, Faldo, Ken Brown, all those guys went along and girls and... But he was a very clever man. He could speak five languages or whatever, and he was very astute. And then when, when you talk about uh, this uh, fellow with the long clubs now. Um, yeah, DeChambeau. DeChambeau. I mean, he was thinking about that then. 40 years ago. He, he tried him, and everybody looked at him as if he was stupid. Now, I'm not saying it, it was any good, but he, he'd try anything. He used to say to me, I, I don't know how to teach these big, busted women. <laughs> <laughs> and they were fairly big as well. He stuck balloons underneath and he said he tried to hit golf balls to see if he could work out a way of them swinging the club with what they had. And he sort of worked out that he, they found it better swaying and hitting it because they couldn't actually really go take the, the, the physique. <laughs> and then him just talking about his, his striking, obviously, of people, you know, educating the hands and he thought he was a hands player, but he had phenomenal body speed if you see any footage of him. And we talk about kind of finding the ball with the, finding the, ball. With the, with the club head and learning to key. learn impact, basically. Well, when you, you actually saw him a guy, person that came, whether it was a man or a woman, and never played the game, never held a golf club. This is one of his pupils, because they all wanted a lesson they had in the cotton. They could go back and talk about it, you know, at the dinner in the evening or something. He said, well, I don't care how you hold the club. He said, can you see that? In fact, this is really, you've all seen this, I'm sure you've used it, where you can just, you know, uh, this is, uh, you know, a bit lost and showing people what the club face is going to do with the ball. Yeah. And of course, he, the way he interpreted it was that, uh, I want you to get that face of the club, I want you to hit that tie like that. And if you do it with your palm and your hand, you do it. So I don't care whether you hold it like this, and if you hold it incorrectly and you hit it this way or that way, it hurts. So then they say, well, that hurts. Mr. Mr. I said, yeah, but you're going to get it like that. And then he would show them the grip, grip afterwards, which is really completely the reverse. The other things that he used to say, I'm not saying they apply today, but it's another way of thinking how you can help people because we're all different, was that he, he said that um, basically he used to say that if you look at, he said at this, when I played, he said, and even today this was, and he said, when you see a fader of the ball, usually that left hand is over here. Strong, that way. So they can hit it that way. It keeps the face open. Swear to it. He said, as soon as I put it here, I can turn that left hand over. All depends on whether you're right-sided or left-sided as well. Which is your clever side? If I ask all of you sitting down to write on a piece of paper, I am a good golfer with your best handwriting, and then I ask you to do with the other one, it's like spider writing. I don't know if you've ever tried it, but it's an old way of... Uh, that goes back to a, uh, a conference I went to many, many years ago. And they were trying to emphasize when you're holding something with two hands, they've got to work together. And the best way is when the palms are opposite, whether they're this way, this way, this way, but they want to be opposite so they can work together. And you've got to educate left-sided shots, right-sided shots, which Henry was very much ahead of his time. We yeah, used incredible. to all our incredible. players in the Gulf Union of Ireland. And uh, they, were quite, they were pretty good with whichever was their cleverest side. I know we've got a lot of a lot of stuff to get through. I know, I'm sorry about it. No, it, no, it's, no, it's okay because <laughs> the great stories and we've got plenty of time. And I, I was telling you about a pal of mine who I used to caddy for, who was a member of um, Worsley and Royal Bird. I went for a lesson off Cotton, who, and he was a scratch player. This guy was a good player. And he said, just hit some of the that tree, young man, which he proceeded to do. <laughs> and he kind of looked at him in disdain and then said okay hit me something like that and they said can you do this where cotton proceeded to hit some one-handed over the tree with his left hand you then do the same with his right hand then push a ball down in the floor and whack it with a, a forward out of a divot and i know people say he was a bit aloof and so on 
And I think you tell the tale of somebody going up to them, telling them how brilliant their child was. Yeah, whenever his finished, reaction. Yeah, whenever he finished his morning session, he'd go into the uh, the, the, the the golfers bar at the top there. It was fantastic. He'd have his meal there, eating away just, and then he would go for a sleep in the afternoon. And then he'd invite somebody to play with him in the afternoon, nine holes, and. Um, he was eating away in this particular day and this guy came up to him and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Cotton, he said, but, uh, sorry to interrupt, he said, but I've got a young man here, he said, he plays off four or five, plus five, plus four handicap. And he just continued to, and he looked up. Hmm. <laughs> and he kept eating. And he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cotton, he said, I'm, um, I, I brought this young man here, he plays off plus, plus four, plus five. And he said, I'd love you to have a look at him. And anyway, on the third time of asking, he looked up to him and he said, don't tell me what his handicap is, just tell me what he's won. <laughs> and that was his way of saying, don't disturb me. He could cut you off like that if he didn't, you know, if you didn't approach him in the right way. But he didn't like silly questions because he thought it was a silly question. He said, just tell me what he's won. Just tell me if he's winning. If you can win in the third division, you can win the second, you can win in the first and you can win in the premier or whatever. He wanted a winner. That's the first thing he wanted. It's an attitude of mind. We used to call it desire. <laughs> exactly. So just talking about um, desire in the in the, again the, the the famous little book, and and I will possibly share the screen in a moment with these. But you, I know we we've got some people on, on the webinar tonight that we're going to ask. But you talked about the three Ds and the three Ps. The three Ds being desire and discipline and dedication and the three p's being patience perseverance and practice how, right. how, how i mean the book's full of little gems like this but just talk to us a little bit about those that you feel that every player needs if they're going well, to be successful you know with Audrey harrington i don't know what you want to talk about Audrey harrington, mm. but my first job when i went over there was we had i inherited a coaching system it's not a criticism, I just didn't point. They, said it, they thought it was pretty good. You had 16 boys, uh, you had 16 boys, 16 youth, 16 senior squad. But unfortunately, the boys and the, uh, and, the, and the youths were mixed together, which is not the right way to start with. And there was only one person there, that was me, on a Friday. I used to go over and we'd work on Saturday and Sundays. That was in, during the off season. And the first session I had with them, the, the, the officials as they are and uh, the selectors came and had a list of the names and one was on the top was uh, Leslie Walker who was the British Boys Champion at the time and then he went through all the list of them and you know, this, 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 this and he got down here to, to Podrick Hamilton and said don't worry about that, that player there, he said I don't think he's going to make it and I just said look I'm going to give the best I can to all of these and I ain't got much time to work with them individually but I get to know them and they get to know me and they get to know my ideas and philosophy. I said I'm just going to talk common sense and logic. I'm going to stick to basics fundamentals and then uh, common sense and logic. I said I've heard an awful lot and seen a lot of, of such great talent. I said almost field players that just do it by instinct. I'm a great believer. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I talk about Laura now because she's she's with us tonight. But Laura, um, if you're brought up on a hilly golf course, it's a tremendous advantage, I think. If you're brought up on a links course, it's like in a driving range. If you're hitting balls up a, a good lie all the time, it's not the best practice. It's all right to get you going. But in the ultimate, when you get a ball up here and a ball down there this way and that way, then you're learning. Even if nobody's showing you, you learn. That's the way I learned in my days. But um, and so I digressed a bit there. Haven't I? <laughs> well, just on that. Oh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Howard. On that note, if I may, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'd yeah. like to share the screen for a moment because you've really kind of alluded to the fact there about learning to arrange the golf club. So whether you're Bubba Watson or no, absolutely who, whoever you are, and yeah. it's my limited technology that allows me to do this if you can bear with me one second folks i'm just going to try and share the screen and go into my um, computer here with a bit of luck uh, bear with me we can find some videos and i'd just like to hopefully everybody will be able to see this don't blink on this one <laughs> no 
Um, uh, hopefully you can see that, folks. You got sound. <laughs> you haven't got the sound on, have you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to minimise that there, folks. So, hopefully, and um, bear with me one second. I'm getting technology working again. I'm just going to stop sharing that screen. So I don't. I'm sorry, I was there no sound came up on that one, no. there, folks. I'm sorry about that. My apology. But that was Tiger, as you you, you could see, Howard, and the, the gentleman from the, the disabled. Can tell a little story. I love you, out of court, and I hope yes. my son doesn't tell me off for this. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, it was in the Australian President's Cup there last year. They played mm. the Australian Open, and all the the uh, golfers with disability were playing in there. And maybe Tony might be talking about that. I used to forget time. But basically, they played in the President's Cup, and the, some of the the guys that were playing. I mean, they were playing down there in, in the tournament, the actual open in the Australian Open. And then so many of them came into there, and this was a, an, an island green, as you see. It's only about ninety hundred yards, I think. And uh, Tiger Woods and various other people were hitting three balls each, and see who were the best. And and this this guy said to Tony, I think the night before, he said, "I'm thinking of taking my leg off." <laughs> he said, "Do I need to ask for permission to do it?" And I think Anthony said, because this is on worldwide television. Of course, time. yes. And um, uh, Anthony said, no, I wouldn't do anything. Just just do it. Don't tell anybody because they're going to have a committee meeting and everything else. Probably that's what he was thinking. And uh, anyway, that's what he did. And then this, this commentator, when he was saying, he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm taking my leg off. What do you mean you're taking your leg off? You know, so he took it off and gave it to Tiger Woods. And Tiger Woods was <laughs> gobsmacked. Yeah. And it's proceeded to hit it onto the green, you know. So, so it was quite interesting, you know. And I thought it was, frankly, everybody was absolutely amazed about it, and they went over the moon about it. You know, being Australian as well, I think they loved it. And, oh, uh, fan fantastic! And I think the, you know, we, we're going to talk later about the the, the yeah. um, European Disabled Golf Association and so on. But the 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 skilling golf, if you like, is to arrange that club to to produce the desired impact. Um, conditions mm -hmm. and as I say when we're talking about coaching philosophies and so on again there's so much to um, to talk about and again it all comes in your book but you, you mentioned Laura and I'm, and I'm going to bring her in because I think on certain occasions that she, she'd visited maybe um, county coaching and so on and so forth but you would built that um, resilience with her shall we say and I uh, if you recall of course I was the professional Laura was a junior at my golf club I was at or she was little, her and her dad and uncles and everybody were there long before I went there in 1984 at Shawley Golf Club or Hall at Phil <laughs> and you were over the road at Duxbury Park and obviously coaching her and she went on to great success as a um, Solheim Cup player and winning uh, four or five times on tour and numerous top tens and Probably going back to again all these coaching psychology, really, which we're going to come to a little bit. You taught her those things long before kind of Bob Rotella and all the, the mind gurus made that um, popular. Um, yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think it. I think it helps an awful lot. Uh, I mean, Laura and Padre Harrington; those are the two in particular. I bring those out because you know people know them. Uh, but I think they came up from a very good background. Their, their parents, I mean, I know uh, Jerry and, uh, and Padraig, who is not alive now, Padraig's dad, mm -hmm. they were great supporters. They, they did whatever they could for the child. They didn't dominate them, but they helped them. They took them there, they did this, they did that, and they gave them some wise words. And I think they let them get on with it then. And I think we were very lucky, at, you would know more at uh, All on the Hill. You know, I think they had... They allowed uh, Laura to, I think what you may be telling this, I don't know, they allowed her to play off the, the men's tees and various mm -hmm. other things. And there were, I think, like uh, a lot of good members there, which I'm sure she will uh, refer to. <clears throat> so, you know, they're all very helpful. But in the end, all, all you can do is to try and help the person, whoever it is, the best way you can get, help them to get the best out of themselves. And all the credit in the end obviously goes to the player. And it's been it's nice that you've been helping them along the way, whatever, whichever way you've helped them. And you help different ones in different ways. 
of and, course. You know, and the one about Harrington is is a long one, and 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 then Laura, Laura came over to Penina, I think at, at that time she did. Uh, she followed us over there, and I said, "Come over, you can stay with us." And you know, and so yeah, I think in the end, you, you don't take the thinking away from the player. I think that's what is possibly, I don't know, happening today. Um, maybe they think, and they press the button, flick a switch, everything happens. And, and it just, golf isn't like that. Uh, you don't learn a language, you don't learn to play an instrument in a few days or a few weeks or a few months sometimes. It takes time. And I think that's the one feeling I have for the youngster today. I have a lot of feeling from the, because they, a lot of them, not all of them, have a, an instinct that it's got to happen. Why can't they have it now? Yeah, we live in that in instant society where they're being they're consuming that much on video and, and yeah. stuff instantly. Without we, we myself and, and Neil, the captain, we often talk about the kind of old days of going out with your seven iron and whacking them at a tree, and then learning oh. to shape them. And you alluded yeah. to Laura, Laura playing at Hall at Hill, and yeah. I'm going to bring Laura in now, if I may, Laura, if you if you Should are I leave there. The room? No, no, I leave no, the room? no, 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 no. So I don't know if you can hear us, Laura. I've yes, unmuted I'm your mic and I'm just yeah. going to find you there. Super duper can see you now. So everybody, this is obviously if you don't know Laura, I'm sure her reputation precedes, precedes her. But, um, you know, as I say, four wins on the ladies tour and 94 Solheim Cup player and so on. So can we see you there, Laura? Yeah. Yeah. I've got you, lost your video there for a moment. I think got you. Okay. And... Laura, can you tell me briefly, I know obviously I was at Hall at Hill at the time and there were so many good young men players there and, and your dad was a, a, a Commonwealth weightlifter and so on, so very competitive, Jerry, and still going strong, which is great to hear. Yeah. By the way, there's that competitive gene and whether your desire you used to, when I was there, you'd just spend all day chipping and putting and hitting balls, but I'm sure... Howard obviously like Harrington and, and so on for me when I read all about it he was shaping these players teaching them independence teaching them self-discovery if you like and resilience could you shed a little bit of light on that without making his head too big <laughs> absolutely well it's funny you mentioned about Bob Rotella because um Howard used to talk about the 15th club you know 36 years ago and and then you know Bob Rotella that was one of his books titled that so yeah I think um, whether Bob pinched it off Howard or not I'm not sure but um, I think um, you know from um, a golfing uh, technical side I was by far the 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 best set of um, technical skills but I think what I did have down to Howard and a lot to do with my dad as well was the was was the mental side of it and uh, mm -hmm. and and as he mentioned playing a golf course that was extremely undulating as well pre presented itself with different challenges every day so mm -hmm. um, but I and think and, and the weather as well of course you know the weather was <laughs> yeah you know tough yeah. up there on that hill and I say you're up against a lot of good young men who were some great players well, yeah. learning to arrange the club, as you say, off those hilly lies and and so on. <coughs> yeah, so, it was. You it say was that sometimes the golf course is the best coach, you know. It tells you what you can and can't do. It's like I the lie you. of the board. You can, you, you, people say, well, you've got a little, little shot onto the green. I say, well, I can't tell you that until I see the lie of the ball. You know, it's, it tells you what to do, doesn't it, Laura? You know? Absolutely, yeah. If, if, you, if your mind is... is empty <laughs> so to speak it you know there's you can you can take in every lesson the golf course is giving you but if you if your head is full of of you know rubbish you're gonna miss everything then aren't you really so but um you know i, I think i think you know f for me in my coaching now i hear a lot of what i say it's spooky sometimes because it's just like it, uh, Howard speaking through me in, in what I've learned from him all those years gone and I made so many notes from the age of 13 with Howard so those that pile of notes was actually still coming on tour with me when I was 41 
uh, I mean, it's I know it's bonkers, isn't it? We tend to do the same things, you know, wrong half a dozen things throughout our career. But it was always fantastic to look back at those things and reflect with with um, the times I'd had with Howard. And yeah, wherever he went, I went. So I went to Portugal and I went over to Newark where uh, yes, Tony, Tony was then based. Howard, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Um, Superb, yeah. and you, you, you kind of bring me on to something there now, Laura, if I may, and thank you for that contribution, Laura, it's great to see you again. Nice to and, be and, here, and, thank no, you. No, thank you. And um, Laura there spoke about you know, everything that you're kind of almost <laughs> hearing yourself see, but having too much going on in your head, and Howard and I spoke about kind of two voices, the kind of conscious battle, and again, psychologists still invented these days with the chimp paradox and all these things, but Howard again was writing about these and talking about them. 30, 40 years ago about the definition of skill and building a routine and so on. Uh, and also this business with the two voices, um, Howard, of trying to control yeah. things in your, your, your self-dialogue. Yeah, two voices. I mean, some of you may hear things that you don't already know about. So, um, but basically I always felt, I studied psychology, I got some sort of a degree in it, so I'll get another or diploma or anything. So. But basically, I found that to try and keep it simple in layman's terms, which I could understand and hopefully other people can, um, that I think you have two voices. You have one on your left shoulder, one on your right. And the left shoulder is the conscious mind and the one here is the subconscious mind. And the best way I can describe it to, to the pupil, which is I think is what I do. Again, you don't know who you're working with. I think the first thing, if I can just digress a little bit, I think your first thing, uh, 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 meeting with a consultant they ask you questions for the first half hour is it worse in the morning when did you get it how long have you had it etc etc and i think that's that's what we as coaches should do and we, we do do if, if you get that opportunity but sometimes you don't they want to stick in plaster to, just to get you through the day or the whatever it is an old saying and uh, unless you know are you working with a scientist or an engineer or a perfectionist those people you can help but they're a little bit more difficult to help but you can help them but you have to do it in a different way and maybe the technology which we've got today is fantastic you know your track man and your base plates and all the rest of it and yeah, it is but if it's used with the correct person it's the old saying and you've read it probably if you change uh, an artist into a scientist like Ballester, you, you ruin them so you're going to find out who you're dealing with and what do they want from the game so i've digressed a little bit but i think it's so important Going back to this, uh, you would probably call it the getting into, how do I get into the zone? Of the mm. and, 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 and you've probably done this yourselves. You say, well, what does practice make? And everybody says, oh, perfect. I said, no, it doesn't. He said, what do you mean? I said, it makes permanent. So if you practice like I used to do, you become good at doing it wrong. And so therefore I have to start all over again and try and learn. But when you learn to drive a car, you get in the car, I used to drive motorbikes, and in my day, just that old now, you used to put arms out the window and do signals. <laughs> I thought, I'll never drive a car, I'll go back to motorbikes. But anyway, I learned to drive the car because I had some instruction, and they told me the best way of doing it in the correct way. So when you drive your car, you drive the car with your subconscious mind, and you talk to the passenger with your conscious mind. And if any of you have changed from a gear shift to an automatic, you'll know this straight away. The first thing the guy sells was trying to sell you, stick your left leg under the chair and you're not going to need it. And you think, what do you mean? Well, you don't need it. You do everything with your right leg in an automatic, don't we? So when you come to do it, all of a sudden your left leg goes out and you say, what am I doing? So you've, you've educated your subconscious mind to do it instinctively. And so that is how we want to try and learn to play the game of golf and get into a bubble, if you like, or get into your zone uh, by practicing on hilly courses and everything else uh, that gets you into some idea of picturing the shot and then you go through your routine and play. And, and, and it's a little bit like, uh, um, I digress a little bit again, but I, I like to get it over. You've had a lot of really good players in sport, like tennis or hockey or badminton or whatever, and football, etc. And they, when they get over that uh, peak of their, and they come to play golf, they play golf, with it, they all of a sudden they get down to a certain pretty good handicap, maybe eight, nine handicap, and they come to a brick wall. And uh, like all of us now, the human beings, <laughs> we're all different. And they say, you know, I can't get any better. I said, he said, why do you think, why do you think that's difficult? He said, well, it's a mental game, this, isn't it? it, it you know, and it's this and it's that. I said, well, okay, yeah. 
I said, well, there's two reasons why this game is difficult. You don't start looking for faults in the swing before you start looking for faults in the dress. That's number one. Number two is the ball is still. It's not a reaction game. It's like you taking a penalty every time or hitting the ball over that rugby bar. I said, you're thinking about where you're going to hit it in there or there or there or whatever you're going to do. And then you step back your two, three steps or whatever it is, and then you do it. And you practice like that. So when you get into a situation where millions of people are watching you or you don't let your team down because this is a very important uh, penalty shot, I said, this conscious, mind, this conscious mind is telling you don't miss it, you're going to let everybody down. But your subconscious mind wants you to do what you trained it to and in practice. So practice is very important, as we all know. And so practice makes permanent. So if you're not, you practice like you're going to play and you play like you practice. It's a true saying, isn't it? So these are all little things that I think you've got to give pictures in people's mind as soon as you can. Now, and the other reason that it's difficult, this game, when you really think about it, and even major winners find this difficult to do, is aiming correctly all the time. And we so obviously see them with the lines, if they've tried to they put the lines down and they aim it at the target. I said, because the ball is over there, parallel lines, if you like, or whatever you want to call it, to the side of you, and we're over here. And we're just trying to aim something here that is over there, that way. I said, when you're shooting a gun, you're behind it. When you're pulling bow and arrow, you're behind it. When you're playing snooker, you're behind it. You can see. But we're not like that in golf. You're over here. Trying to aim something over there that way. I said, so that is the hardest thing to do, is consistently aim correctly day after day. And even uh, the top players find that. And to do that, going back to the days of, of, of Harrington and, and your venue in... in um, 88 and 89 you started working with them as you say you had that first meeting with, with the squads and you got into the various squads and obviously during that period you were involved with Harrington, Darren Clark, Graham McDowell and a young Rory ultimately and then uh, Michael Hoey and Walker and McGinsey. Did you have any inkling then? I know it's a kind of $64,000 question for most coaches where somebody makes it who you didn't think was going to and then the other chap who was, appeared to be talented didn't maximise that talent or didn't just didn't happen as, or fulfil their potential. Were we getting back in? You, you talked about Harrington in the book, wanting, having, a, having a want, a desire. Uh, how important is that? Yeah, I think the first time I had with him, uh, what I did, for my benefit really, uh, I just took each one of them and I was one of them for probably, then those it was video, a big, great big camera in your shoulder, you know. And I took video of every one of them hitting a few shots and then I did it and then we analysed it when we went, went in at night if it was dark and things like that. When I say analysed it, we just said, I've got the evidence here, what you've come with. <laughs> um, but the one thing I was saying to him, asking him questions about this, that they're trying to get to know what his mental life thing was like. And, and I said to him, and they said, what, why did you, I said, you know, I said, a lot of the top players don't like missing it left. He said, no, no, I don't. So immediately that said to me, he put himself into that category as a good player. He was only off two handicap then at 16. And the other thing he said to me after I was talking for a while, he said, you know, he said, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. I thought, I don't, a 16 year old lad tell you that to me, I don't understand what it is. But what he was trying to say, but I can learn something from everybody. That's what it means. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Because you get information off it. If you ask like that, that's why I thought it was great that last one that you had last week. You know, you ask people for advice, they're normally pretty happy to give it you. And usually the most successful are they're quite happy to give it you because they know you've got to do it. You're not going to take anything from them if that's what people think. Mm. I digress there. But no, no, no. I, I knew he had the desire then. I call it desire. He actually, because I used to have a bit of fun with it. I said, you know, when you get famous, will you come back and talk to these panels like you were? And he said, oh yeah. <laughs> so he wasn't cocky, he was just determined. He was a very intelligent guy, as you know, and he qualified for the And, and, and um, he didn't want to go to his golf scholarship in America. A lot of guys from Ireland went to America and in actual fact some of them came back fairly quickly. Some of them loved it. Paul McGinley and G-Mac, they loved it. And they, they 
thrived on it, but it's not for everybody. But he said, I'm going to do night school, I'm going to get me thing. And he said, uh, he, he described desire when he came to give the talk, when he got for professional and everything, as want. It's the same thing. And in the book, I describe certain other people in sports, they dis describe, but desire comes up. We have the desire to win, I had the desire to do it. And if you don't have that in life, in anything you try, it's when the going gets tough. I mean, we've all had, oh, I'm sure that some of you chap chaps sitting down there and listening or whatever, you've had some really good potential. I think this fella could be a will beater. But when he gets to a certain level, they don't seem to want it bad enough. You don't have the happens. desire yeah. to take the ups and downs. See, golf and life run very parallel. What I mean by that, you have your ups and your downs in life, and you have your ups and downs in golf. And somehow you've got to be able to handle the bad times. Somehow you've got to adapt. And then we'll be talking about later that possibly if we get time, we don't run out of time with the... Uh, yeah, golf certainly. Well, what I want to do now, if I may, um, Howard, just quickly, if I can find um, this, I just a little... Thing. I just literally, very briefly earlier, I don't know if everybody can see those um, things there with me one second, but this was just some little paragraphs of about your golfing success. I don't know if you can see those folks. Yeah. So this is a little excerpt out of the book, just to give you a taster of what somebody would need, his attitude, desire, goals, memory, motivation, patience, persistence, preparation, practice, self-discipline. And I think these these things you... Um, instilled into both mm. Laura and Harrington, you know, a definition of skill here, yeah. you know, about creating good habits. You talked about the pilots, I know a pilot you coached about um, having yeah. that final checklist, That's you know, right. yeah. and other things here, which are very relevant for all of us and still hold true today. And again, you wrote these many years ago, but what to be a, a, the best coach in particular, no priority order here, but understand the pupil. You know, have empathy, be a good listener, have patience, be a motivator, be a giver, have many different ways of communicating. And all these things here, you know, make sure you have a thirst for knowledge. But here you are, 83 years of age, and still as keen as, as mustard, you know. Be the eternal optimist. Remember, there's no substitute for experience. You know, you have to do the time in the trenches, give a lot of lessons, have a good attitude, you know and earn the respect of your pupils, which you've done as a player and as a retailer and so on. And I think this one, remember that the pupils don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that takes it kind of further to um, uh, these factors, desire, discipline, dedication, patience, perseveration, all those factors. And obviously you can see here your 2006, the awards ceremony with... Um, Harrington and obviously your good lady Sylvia and Rory yeah. and, 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 and Podrag and his, his wife was, was superb and, and they kind of go on to the, as I say you, you've achieved the master professional status and so is Tony and I'd like to, to bring Tony in if I may I'm just going to unmute him because again I remember the days and um, of playing against Tony in the, the, the Lancashire leagues you set up and some of the boys in this audience uh, who are listening today certainly do. And Tony, you obviously, I know your dad's very proud of you and you must be um, equally proud of him if you are there, sir. Absolutely. Um, can you hear me okay? Well, I can hear and see you, sir. Okay, so yeah, absolutely. You couldn't have a better coach, you couldn't have a better father. I mean, it's... Uh... It's a joy to listen to him. He sometimes drives me nuts because he gives me a call at 7.30 in the morning or 6.30 in the morning and says, I've just got this idea here about this. What do you think about that? And, you know, so that's, uh, that's quite entertaining. But uh, yeah, he's uh, it, continual learner. You know, he's got a thirst for knowledge and always wants to know what's going on, always keen to find out what's happening, keen to find out how he can try and help more people. And so from that perspective, he, he just couldn't get any better. So it's a, it's a perfect opportunity for him to, to keep learning. And uh, keep, as long as he keeps learning, he'll keep young. No, and I think he was so much a, a pioneer, both, you know, as I say, as a retailer, as a player, as a coach, and all these, 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 these uh, um, things I've discussed and showing you the book there. I do urge everybody, the book is All the Money Goes to Charity, the Rosemere uh, Cancer 
if I'm going to do it, urge everybody to visit howardbennett.co.uk later on after this meeting because if it doesn't help you personally, it will help you with you, your coaching, you know, for most of us which are here as coaches, but I know it will definitely help me as a player. Even this evening, I said to Howard, you know, Howard I'm, you know, I'm more nervous doing this. It's like playing the first tee of the Open. And he said, well, if you were nervous, it, it doesn't mean it doesn't matter. <laughs> so that was another gem, you know, from the vault. And from your own point of view, Tony, now just getting into the European um, Disabled Golf Association, I know you were the, the president and so on, and very heavily involved in this emerging market that a lot of people with, some people obviously born with um, should they, deficiencies and other people with injuries and, and so on. But it, we, I believe it represents about 17% of the, the market share potentially in golf, and many golf clubs are missing an opportunity and golf pros to coach these people and it is going and, and hopefully ultimately once it gets more recognition maybe in the, the Paralympics and so on like like golf has in the Olympics um, could you just allude a little bit to that and obviously I know your dad's got the same passion about this area yeah I mean I, I mean I didn't know anything about golf for the disabled you know and I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say that you know 40 years at that stage I was I think at that time I was about 40 how old would I be? About 49, something like that. So I'd been around the game for, you know, quite a number of years. You know, I've had it. And then all of a sudden it kind of dropped on my lap that I, I used to work for the PJs of Europe. Uh, a funding application came in, European Disabled Golf Association, what do they do? I better go and have a look at an event, see what goes on. And I was kind of floored by it. I was like, uh, I, I don't quite understand what I'm seeing here. And um, I think that, that made me think quite a lot. And it, it sort of made me take everything that I knew at that time and sort of question it really and put it on the table, question it, challenge it, and say, well, does that actually make any sense? You know, so just to use one of my dad's comments that he made earlier there is that, you know, you've got two Vs pointing up to your right hand side, that sounds okay, but what happens if you haven't got a V? You know, what happens, weight transfers, well, what happens if you're only on one leg? What about ground reaction forces if you sat in a wheelchair? You know, so these kind of things make a difference. And so that was, that was certainly a big learning curve for me. And, and you're right, it's a, it's a massive part of, of the community. And I often say it is that, look, 15% of the world is disabled. And that's not 15% of Africa or 15% of some impoverished countries. It's 15% of the world, it's 15% of Chorley, uh, to use, you know, where, 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 where you were. It's 15% of Bolton, it's 15% of Manchester, it's 15% of everywhere. And that's one in seven people. And it's a, it's a pretty interesting uh, market when you think of it like that. So that means on the planet we've got about 1.2 billion people with disability. And at the moment, golf is in the normal population achieving about 1% penetration into the, the whole of the, the, the world's population. So even if golf only attracted 0.25 of 1%, a quarter of 1%, it's 214 million golfers. It's a, it's a bunch of people. And so, you know, I think that, uh, sorry, 214 million was the full amount. So if 50, it's around about 50 million people that we're talking about, a quarter of a percent. So it's a lot of people, it's everybody that's walking around in the UK right now that's not getting the opportunity to play. And as you say, for, for golf professionals, that may well be. And, I's not, and again, I'm like you, I've been teaching for 40 odd years and it's not I've occasionally uh, done it. And uh, unfortunately, a young man I coached just passed away in a couple of weeks before last uh, and they had one leg and cancer and so on. And that was my first opportunity to get involved with him. And... As I said to your dad and I said to poor young Chris, the, the, the ball doesn't know you've, not got, you've only got one leg or one sure. arm or whatever. Again, it's about arranging that golf club and having fun and joy doing that. We had an interesting one only a few days ago because um, we do a lot of work now with the European Tour. We've got uh, 12 of our players that play in European Tour events. So they played the Scottish, they played two Rolex series last year. So they were at... Um, Scottish at the Renaissance Club and they were at the DP World Championships in Dubai. And they put some red scores in, they did really, really well. But they, 
the interesting part about it is, is that <coughs> the, the way that they play is quite impressive. And so we did a, a thing with the European Tour a couple of days ago. Louis Eusterhazen was out there. He got 47,000 likes. And I think I'm right in saying it was something like, sorry, 47,000 views. And I think I'm right in saying he got something like 19 shares. He had like one postigo on one leg, 168,000 views and something like 150 shares. And you look at it and you go, well, why is that? Is this a freak show? Is that what it's all about? It's not a freak show. They just look at these, these guys and go, hang on a minute, if that guy can do that on one leg, why am I complaining about my dodgy knee? Why am I complaining about my stiff shoulder? So what is it that they do? And you're quite right in what you're saying. You've said it a few times tonight, Adrian, it's very perceptive of what you say, is they organize the club. They are self-organizing mechanisms. We all are. Yeah. But the nice thing about this is that they've got a constraint. Whatever that constraint might be, it might be that they've got just their lead arm or they've got just their trail arm or they're sat in a wheelchair or they're blind or they're short stature. And they don't want any sympathy. They, they play the same golf courses. I mean, when I talked about uh, the Renaissance Club a few minutes ago and the DP World, they played off the same tees as the pros. They play to the same flags, the Sunday flags, the Saturday flags, the Sunday flags, exactly the same as the tour flag pros. So they don't, they don't ask for any quarter, they don't give any quarter. They're just a golfer and that's our strap line, which is golfers first. Great. With that said, Tony, and, uh, and I hope, I'm, I'm going to unplug my um, earphones ultimately and hopefully I can get the sound on this little video, but I am going to share the screen now. I may ask you if there is no sound to just do a little bit of a, and co-opt you to do a little bit of a commentary. And if I can ask the other, the audience, this is about four or five minutes long, but there's some fascinating examples uh, of, of people. I mean, I will, I don't know why the audio was working, but I'm going to try and do it. So, uh, and, and if it, you can commentate, just give me the thumbs up and I'll, I'll yeah. give you. Uh, if you can't hear anything, um, and I, I hope, you know, from um, this evening, uh, Point of view, bear with me a second, folks. I'm just going to get into my videos. Um, we're going to round up the evening very shortly, and I do want to thank Howard after and obviously all the participants. But now, hopefully, you'll be able to hear this. And I'm going to take my and let's have a little look here. What do I like about golf? Are we okay with sound? It's like a mirror of life. I do absolutely get excited about playing golf because you can measure yourself against yourself. Well, this, this is a guy called Chris Biggie. Chris has got cerebral palsy. This was just a deep He was just really um, a very inspirational kind of guy. He just he's, he, he does Paralympic skiing in the winter. Got involved with golf. He's a golf coach. He's a qualified PGA of America professional. And uh, Chris, as you'll be able to see, he kind of walks a little bit funny. That's cerebral palsy. And the way that they describe that is that the brain talks to the legs. And so if they want to move, uh, the brain telephones the legs and says walk. And of course, if they can't walk, then um, it means they haven't got a telephone. So it's, it's quite fascinating to see Chris play. It's a wonderful example of how you self-organize the club. This gentleman here is a guy called Trivga. I'm not even going to say his second name, but it's Trivga Larson at the end of it. And uh, Trivga is um, a Norwegian guy came off a motorbike, found that he got one leg pointing in completely the wrong direction and the other leg was uh, seven. So uh, he kind of put himself back together again and he's an athlete as you can see, he's a strong guy. And again, he was at the Paralympics in Punjang and uh, also an extremely good example of the kind of people we've got. One thing that Trippi says all the time is that when he lost his leg, he lost his identity. And golf gave him his identity back. 
it allowed him to be a sports person again. So really important that social inclusion is, is absolutely vital. Here's Meta from Denmark, and she's a twin. She also has cerebral palsy. And cerebral palsy is an interesting one. In, well, it's not actually cerebral palsy. All disabilities are really interesting in so much that when you've met a disabled person, you have met a disabled person. They're not all the same. So you can say amputee is like another amputee. The, the, the position of the amputation may be slightly different. The prosthetic may be slightly different. And so it's a fascinating um, problem for a coach to try and figure out how can they best help the player. Adam Wabi, Adam from um, Belgium, and Adam's a, a real good kid, and he's at this stage here, he's 19 years of age, he's now 21, plays off one handicap, I think he's off 1.1, and Adam talks here a little bit about the difficulties that he has to be able to control his legs. Multiple sclerosis would be a, a similar kind of thing, where the, many times the players can't control their movements. And so we have many multiple sclerosis players that play in a wheelchair. Uh, but the thing about Adam is that he says when he's on the golf course, he doesn't feel disabled. He said all he, all he says is that he sees in front of him, he doesn't see anything. He just thinks he's a normal guy. And in fact, he played in the Australian Open uh, in 2018 and said he couldn't believe who he was watching. And it was actually himself. He said, well, I don't walk like that, do I? Marcus Mallow. This is one Postigo. One uh, hits it around about 260 through the air. Richard Saunders here with short arms. Uh, you, watch what, you want to see somebody with, uh, that's impressive, just look at short arm players. Put the golf club underneath their arm and swing. And we've got all ages here from this gentleman there, it's pretty old. But Jennifer here, you'll see at this stage, she's 15 years of age. I think probably one of the strongest comments is going to come in just a second and you're going to see a guy in a wheelchair called Shlomo Ivgi. And Shlomo, this is him. And Shlomo, Shlomo says, without golf, I'd think I was disabled. Thank you. And, and thank you for that commentary, Tony. And I'll have to sort the sound out there. But that, and thanks for your contribution, Tony. Super, um, super thank you very much. So there we are, folks, that obviously, again, getting back to Howard's journey from um, Southport, the news agent shop and as a retailer and a player and so on. Uh, as I say, he's gone on to coaching Laura and, and Harrington and Darren Clark and so on, all these people. I think one of the big factors is, apart from being just super professional, is that he treated everybody equally and trying to get the, the, the most out of that individual. So we're back, what, again, nothing new in coaching, but how and I discussed it, that you're coaching the person. Would you agree with that, Howard? Yeah, I think that's right. It's, it's coaching the person and, yeah, trying to find out. Um, yeah, it's been a, it's quite humbling. I've, I've been very fortunate to do a, a job, if you want to call it a job, that I really enjoy. And uh, it's not been a job to me. It's been a, you know, just seeing people improve, it's, it just gives you a buzz, doesn't it? it it's, it's the next best thing to play in the game. I remember the 100 metre runner, uh, and he said that, was it Daly? And he said that uh, when he gave up and he Olympic gold medalist for 100 metres, and he said, he started coaching them and he saw one of his guys win this tournament. And he, uh, and he said, do you get the same thrill as you used to do when you were winning? He said, no. He said, but it's the next best thing, mm. <laughs> which really is true. You know, if you can't do it to help somebody and see them do well, but even, you know, bringing the handicap down to the golf club or anything, it doesn't matter. It's, um, we're so blessed to be able to play and work with so many different people. And it's like a, it's like a puzzle. It's a, you know, you've got to find out who you're working with and then try and get the best you can for them and, and communicate in so many different ways, which is, is, is very, very important, I think. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, that's where you are. Again, you were 
bit of pioneering because you said reading the books about the psychology of selling or the psychology of yeah, when they ask me to read this book i'm interrupting you now people say it's, uh, i'm not Throughout my career, people say, well, you made that game sound simple. I said, well, golf is a simple game made difficult by human beings, which it is true. I don't know where that came from or whether I thought about it, but it's very true. And I, they said, well, why don't you write? And I said, no, I said, I don't want to write. There's thousands of books, and I've read them all probably as well. <laughs> I said, but uh, anyway, when I retired, somebody said, why don't you just write a book about your last 15 years? Because you've got some interesting stories there and throughout your career. And I said, well, I want it to be different, and uh, it would appear that it does. I mean, it's, it's, we're on our eighth reprint now, I think. Is it Keith? Eight reprints in? And um, it's a book that you can, yeah, I think we're trying to make it interesting, you know. And, uh, and, uh, I've got, I think I've unmuted Keith there, and um, <laughs> I don't know if you'd want to come on, Keith, but you... Want to come on, Keith. Well, can I say it's been a brilliant uh, privilege to be with you. As a 12 handicapper based at Leyland, um, I feel a bit of a fraud, but I'm in the company of some very special people. And that's why I, I came up with this idea 15 years ago to, to set up a golf society, fundraising golf society for the Rosemead Cancer Foundation, which is based in Preston, but it serves Lancashire and South Cumbria. It's the equivalent of the Christie in Manchester and Clatter Bridge in Merseyside. And um, uh, I first um, invited Norman Prince, some of you will know of Norman, and, uh, and Paul Eel to join us as, as, as patrons. And they said, look, Keith, we've got a broad need out. Let's uh, involve some other local, well-known, respected golfers, past and present. So we made contact with Howard and the lovely Laura, and our lives have never been the same since. It's been brilliant. We surround ourselves with nice people to have some fun. We put the fun into fundraising for our local can cancer charity. And Howard's book has helped to raise hundreds and hundreds of pounds, endorsed by Laura and uh, Paul. Paul Eels. And so we're very grateful, we're very privileged. And, um, and just to tap into Tony's uh, presence, I had the privilege of joining them at an event over in Lincolnshire, if I recall and to see the wonderful performance by the disabled golfers um, is absolutely inspiring. And I not only want to plug the book for Rosemere, um, but I want to also plug a, man, a fantastic publication that Tony and his family have put together on behalf of the European Disabled Golfers Association. It's absolutely wonderful. So thank you, Adrian, for the opportunity to join you. It's been brilliant and I'm very grateful. Thank, Thank you. you. So just, it's going to, I'm going to unmute our captain and our chairman, and Andy and uh, Neil. Um, Howard, I, I want to um, thank you once again for being such a, a, a great guest. And I know um, we could just go on forever. I've made so many notes here that I've, that I've not um, been able to <laughs> go through. But um, again, just reiterate, without being a salesman, this book, <laughs> Stories, Observations and Suggestions, it's a great little compendium. And it's, say. You just do it rather log into www.howardbennett.com and it tells you everything then. But you can't buy it, it's a donation. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> I think they're asking you for about a £10 donation, basically. That's it. <laughs> so Andy, I don't know if you're there as chairman. Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. And I'm just yeah. trying to unmute Neil, but... Um, obviously but no, I, I, just um, um, a massive, massive thank you to you, Howard, uh, to Tony, to Laura, and everybody else. It's a, it's a great thing for us here at the Lancashire PGA to have you on board and and, and speak on behalf of uh, such wonderful people, and then we really do appreciate it. And I, and I do really think that we, we we need to get another one in here because it seems like we've only covered. Maybe well, you want the next 30 years, do you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, Before I'm I get put underground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before well, you get on Somebody said to me, I didn't think that fellow was still around. <laughs> no, it's uh, fantastic, Howard. And I mean, I've enjoyed just the preamble <laughs> with you before. So if I can bring in Neil now, our captain, before we get cut off. But thank yeah. You once again. Uh, Howard, uh, Tony, Laura, thank you very much for your comments. It's just great on, all, on behalf of all our professionals in the Lancashire PGA uh, that you've joined us tonight. 
I mean, just listening to some of them stories, you know, just fantastic. Thank you very much. Also, I've got to thank Adrian. Yeah. Adrian, Absolutely what, not, you, what are you doing for the Lancashire PGA? Yeah. I know you are my best buddy. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> well, come and take me a game of golf. We'll go over there and have a game of golf with me in the summer. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Down's finished. <laughs> but uh, Adrian, what are you doing? You shot a hole. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, don't hey. don't invite Laura though. I don't want to get. Beat no, no, she'll. Right, <laughs> <laughs> um, but Adrian, thank you very much for very doing what you're doing. Uh, but but Howard, you know it's great to see you. Pleasure. I've spent many times at Panina, and I'm actually taking um, Adrian to Panina in November, and we're doing a golf school together. Oh, right. So um, I might go to them penthouse suites that you probably stayed in when you were there, That's up right. the top of the hotel. <laughs> Eh? Yeah, great view from up there, I'll tell you. It is, I know, I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, but uh, Tony, great seeing you again and listening to you, what you're doing with the Disabled Association. Fantastic. And Laura, I'll see you soon. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks, Howard. I'm going to close the meeting. There will be a recording available in the next few days, and we'll put that on the PJ website, but I'll, I'll also have a Thank copy and we'll, we'll email you a link. Thank you again. Folks, thank, thank you, you Ed. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.